Well, let me welcome us as we are gathering and want to read some verses from Psalm 91 as we begin. Samus says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. He will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And the Lord replies, Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now let's sing our opening hymn, which really follows on from that psalm. Number 196, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. Number 196. Let's pray. Once again, the psalmist said, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. 
Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. And Father, we are indeed glad as we rejoice in your love. We praise you for this beautiful sunshine, the reminder of your ancient promise that as long as the earth remains, sowing and reaping summer and winter, day and night will never cease. You are a faithful God, a God who keeps covenant, God who shows steadfast love to a thousand generations of those who believe in you and trust in you. We praise you that in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have opened the kingdom of heaven to all who believe, that one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth where gladness will not be intermittent, where joy and love and peace and harmony will dwell forever because the Lord will be reigning, God will be God, and the world will know it. Yet, Father, we are so slow to hear, we are so ready to misunderstand. Our hearts are full of conflicting impulses and desires. As Paul said, the evil that we don't want to do, we so often do, and the good that we want, our wills are not strong enough to do it. And so we need your grace and your mercy. And we thank you, Lord, that that never turns away, in spite of our faithlessness, in spite of our turning away from you, that you continue to pursue us, you continue to hold open the gate, which is open to all who will turn and repent. And so, Father, we ask you all forgive our many sins, the sins we have committed already today, the sins that we have thought in our hearts, and the way we have so often sung words, said words, spoken words, which we meant at the time, and which so often disappear and vanish away. And so, Lord, we come to you expectingly, expecting that you will speak to us and that you will gladden our hearts and challenge our hearts. And we thank you for this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let me welcome everyone, whichever part of the building you're in. Just um, I'm, I'm not going to go on at any great length about the announcements. They're in this sheet. If you didn't get one this morning, they're there are some at the door. Just one or two things. Remember the lunchtime Bible talk. If you're around on Wednesday and you're able to come, that would be, that'd be encouraging. Paul Brennan will be speaking at that. So, if you are able to come along, it would be greatly encouraging to him. And uh, the Tind Tyndale box on Thursday the 29th and um, Friday the 30th, Activate Antron Youth. And the small groups and disciple begin again on Wednesday the 11th. There'll be more information about that next week. And the, the other announcements, um, take these away, use them for your prayers. And as I said this morning, can you remember our brother Roy Murray, who has shingles and who, you know, whose future plans are obviously up in the air at the moment. So please continue to remember him. Now, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing a version of Psalm 102, number 102. Those of you who've been with us in the Jeremiah series will know that Jeremiah frequently combines lament and praise, as many of the psalms do. And this psalm, in a fine version by Christopher Idle, does just that. It begins with lament and ends in praise. Lord, hear my prayer. My cry shall come before you. Hide not your face when I am in distress, number 102.
Now we are coming once again to the book of Jeremiah. This is our final study at the moment, although we'll be taking up again later. We've come to Jeremiah 29 on page 656. I'm going to read this chapter, and I'm also going to read a few verses in the book of Daniel, which are totally related to this, and I'll be referring to these later. So Jeremiah 29, which brings us to the end of a long section, you'll be glad to know that when we take this book up again, the next chapters are called the Book of Consolation. There hasn't been an awful lot of consolation, it would have to be said, in, in the previous chapters, but um, we'll come to that. Anyway, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemari, the son of Hilkiah, whom, Judah, whom, Je- sorry, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may be your sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for wholeness and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Because you have said, the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon, thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David and concerning all the people who dwell in this city, your kinsmen who did not go out with you into exile, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am sending on them sword, famine, and and pestilence, and I will make them like vile figs that are so rotten that they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with sword, famine, and pestilence, and will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, a terror, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Because they did not pay attention to my words, declares the Lord, that I persistently sent you by my servants, the prophets. But you would not listen, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, all you exiles whom I sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Kaliah, and Zedekiah, the son of Messiah, that's not the king, but a false prophet, who are prophesying a lie to you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall strike them down before your eyes. Because of them, this curse shall be used by all the exiles from Judah in Babylon. The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire, because they have done an outrageous thing in Israel. They have committed adultery with their neighbors' wives, and they have spoken in my name lying words that I did not command them. I am the one who knows, and I am witness, declares the Lord. To Shemaiah, son of Nehalam, you shall say, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, You have sent letters in your name to all the people who are in Jerusalem, and to Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priest instead of Jehoiada the priest. 
to have charge in the house of the Lord over every madman who prophesies to put him in the stocks and neck irons. Now, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah Anathoth, who is prophesying to you? For he has sent to us in Babylon, saying, Your exile will be long. Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. <clears throat> Zephaniah the priest in the, read this letter in the hearing of Jeremiah the prophet. Once again, that's not Zephaniah the prophet, that's a different person. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, send to all the exiles, saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah of Nehalem, because Shemaiah had prophesied to you when I did not send him, has made you trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah of Nehalem and his descendants. He shall not have anyone living among this people. He shall not see the good that I will do to my people, declares the Lord. For he has spoken rebellion against the Lord. And if you keep your finger in there, please, and then turn over to page 746 and to Daniel chapter 9. Between Jeremiah 29 and Daniel 9, some 70 years has passed the entire exile, and Jeremiah, uh, sorry, Daniel is reading these very words of Jeremiah, which we've just read. So let's, let's read the first three verses of Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by the scent of meat, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Amen. That is the word of the Lord. May he bless it to us. Jeremiah, in chapter 29, says to the exiles, seek the welfare of the city where God has put you. And this is taken up in our next hymn, number 920, as the light upon the river, the rising of the sun, shine, O Lord, upon our city, here on earth, your will be done. Number 920. <clears throat>
Oh, we'll have a break for a few moments as we take up the offering. So let's pray. The prophet Isaiah, speaking of the same things as Jeremiah, writes this, You, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Father, how we praise you for the great sweep of your purposes throughout history. Across continents, across centuries, in places unknown and known, you are leading your people towards the great day when you will bring them all home into the new creation. And Father, we want, to, we want to thank you for those, who, for those who brought to us that revelation. Thank you for Moses who brought the first revelation, to whom was revealed the truth about who you are and what you, and what you are. And for the prophets and historians, psalmists, wisdom writers, and others who followed him and who faithfully carried on that message of the Lord, the merciful, the compassionate one, the one who shows steadfast love to all who will believe in him, and yet the God of judgment to those who reject him. We thank you for the apostles, those who were there at the time of the great saving events, for those who bore witness to the Word made flesh, and who have, and who have given to us in their writings the the written word, which along with the words of Moses and, and the prophets, so faithfully and fully point to the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for all the multitude of books that are written, for the visual aids of various types, for all the ways in which that great gospel is still going out to the ends of the earth. And we pray indeed that you will richly bless your people as they take that gospel some to large crowds of people, others to individuals, some to crowded cities, others to very remote areas. But we thank you for that glorious message of liberation, that message that sets people free, that message of jubilee, that message of salvation, that message which points to the day when the Lord will return and everything will be in harmony. And so, Lord, we pray once again for the nations of the world the nations of the world which so often are turbulent and violent, so often turn their back on you and your ways. 
And we pray, Lord, as we think of those who carry the gospel, we pray once again for our brother Roy, ask that this time of enforced um, absence from the work that he loves will be a time when he is able to rest on you and listen to you and to discover indeed the words of Isaiah, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you out. And indeed, any other servants of the Lord who are feeling, who are feeling that they've been discarded or sidelined, we pray that you will come to them with grace and with courage and that you will show them your purposes. Lord, each of us come here with needs some of us rejoicing at exciting events and exciting happenings opening opening up before us, some of us dreading the next days and months, some of us anxious and worried, some of us looking back at a tangle in our lives, very often tangles and sins for which you have forgiven us long ago, for which we cannot forgive ourselves. Father, we pray for your grace in all these places and to all those people. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time to make our common request to you, we pray now, O Lord, to fulfill the desires and petitions of your servants as may be best for them, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the world to come life everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, before we look together at Jeremiah, we're going to sing again, going to sing 556, a hymn that asks the Lord to guide our thoughts and to speak to our hearts as we listen to it. Jesus, Master, at your word, we are gathered all to hear you. Let our minds and wills be stirred now to seek and love and fear you. Number 556. If we could have our Bibles open, please, at Jeremiah 29, that's page 656, and we'll have a moment of prayer before we look together at the Word. 
Lord God, as we have sung, we do indeed need your Spirit to shed light upon those words which he himself inspired and to shed light into our darkened hearts. And we pray, Lord, that is what will happen this evening, that your words will bring a flood of light into our hearts and shed a flood of light on our onward way. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I think you'll agree with me, one of the things that helps us to keep on going as human beings in tough times is hope of better times. I'm sure I'm not the only one who in the months of November and February think of summer sunshine and holidays. And talk about genuine hope, not the kind of futile hope that those of us who support Newcastle United hope for every week that they may win a game. I'm talking about genuine hope, the kind of hope that's rooted in the, char in the character of God, the kind of hope that, brings, that gives us something to look forward to. And you know, that's at the very, very heart of the story of the Bible, living in the present, in the light of the future. I believe that's what is at the very heart of this chapter we've read, living in the present in the light of the future. I've taken my title for this evening from the chapter, from verse 14, a future and a hope. That's what we're going to be looking at this evening. It's very interesting how this hope comes here. We're accustomed to thinking of letters as characteristic of the New Testament. Well, of course, that's true. But here is the first text of a letter in Scripture, a letter sent by Jeremiah the prophet to the exiles in Babylon, telling them, telling them that Babylon will come to an end, but also telling them how to live in the present. You see, like the New Testament letters, of course, he warns against false prophets and false teachers urges obedience to the Word of God. It's the kind of thing Terry was talking about this morning, the false teachers in the church in Colossae in the first century who played down the significance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here are the false teachers who are looking for false hopes. This is not genuine hope. I did not send them, says the Lord. So, in verse, um, in, in verse 14, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place which I sent you into exile. I will bring you back. That is the future and the hope. Now, one of the great things about the Bible is not just its marvelous unity, but its tremendous diversity. And when the prophets are speaking, they're obviously, first of all, speaking to their own time. They are speaking to the people of their time and giving them a hope for that time or immediately beyond it. When the prophets say, I will bring you back, the Lord's words, or the words are read from Jeremiah, I will bring you from all the lands to which I have sent you, it's first and foremost talking about the story we read in Ezra and Nehemiah about how the exiles returned to rebuild, first of all, the temple, then the walls, and the city of Jerusalem. But clearly, that did not fulfill all the prophecies. After all, Isaiah talked about the desert blossoming like the rose. He had talked about the nations coming to Zion, praising the Lord, and not studying war anymore. He had talked about, and Habakkuk talks about, the earth filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That clearly did not happen then. That didn't mean that what happened then didn't matter. What happened then was as, is it where God's saying, look, I'm going to do this. This isn't the end of the story. This is just a trailer of the main, of the main event. And it's very interesting. Throughout Scripture, we have this theme of exile and return right from the very beginning. Adam and Eve exiled from Eden. But there is a way back because there is going to come one who is simply known as the serpent crusher at that time. And there is going to be a way back to the tree of life. Then there's the exile down in Egypt, the exodus led by Moses, which points forward to that greater exodus. 
And then here, the exodus, the exodus which is going to happen in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. If you read these books, you'll find the language that the authors use is the language of exodus. They see this as a new exodus. And 1 Peter talks about God's people as exiles in this world. Well, the American spiritual says, this, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. That's what Peter says. This is not our permanent home. We are in exile. We're exiles in the world. So it's not just the return of God's people from Babylon. It's the end of the age and the gathering of all God's people together in the Father's house in the new creation. Now, I'm going to concentrate on verses 1 to 14 and have it where a couple of footnotes about the rest of the chapter. The material in the rest of the chapter must be, I was going to say, wearisomely familiar to most of us now, and so I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it too much at the moment, but I am going to speak particularly about verses 1 to 14, and I want, I've got two main points I want to make. First of all, these verses tell us how to live in this world, verses 1 to 7, and then verses 8 to 14, how to prepare for the next world. Now, they are totally related, of course. It's not they're two separate things. They're two sides of the same coin. So, first of all, how to live in this world, verses 1 to 7. I want you to notice something which is quite interesting. The letter that Jeremiah sa- sends was sent by these guys, high officials. In other words, it goes in the diplomatic bag. This letter of Jeremiah is not just a private letter. This letter is sent, as I say, in the diplomatic bag. That always seems to be a wonderful picture of the Word of God doing its work in the world. This is, this is a picture of that in this specific time and place. And in verse 7, Jeremiah says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Now, for, now Babylon, you'll remember in the New Testament, becomes a symbol, it's already becoming that, of the world, what John calls the world, the world which passes away the world which, uh, which if we love, the love of the Father is not in us. Some of you would hear Andy Gemmell's fine sermon on that some weeks ago. So, this is what, this is what this, these verses are about. How do we live in this world? I want to suggest various things that this passage is telling us. First of all, make a positive contribution to the communities we live in. Seek the welfare of the city. Don't imagine, please, that everyone who is living for the Lord has to be in what we call full-time Christian ministry. That's a great mistake, because if we think of that, where are we going to get our Christian teachers from, our Christian lawyers, our Christian shopkeepers, our Christian business people, our Christian doctors? Many of God's people, all of God's people are called to serve Him, are called to ministry, but many of God's people are called to minister in the world to seek the welfare of the city, to bring the presence of the Lord right into all these places, the classrooms, the offices, everywhere where we are. And that fits in the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, which is about living, godly living in this world. Wisdom calls out in the streets, in the marketplaces, where, where people gather. You see, so often as Christians, we've on the one hand retreated into ghettos, retreated into ghettos where we become, where we don't know what to say to people. We've no language to communicate with them. We're so different from them. Or else become totally indistinguishable from the world. Now, this will vary from place to place and from time to time. There are no laws and no rules, but um, this passage is saying we will not despise the ordinary good things of life which God gives us gift. Notice this verse 5, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. You see, we won't become obsessed by them, but we won't downplay them. We won't be, we won't retreat into a kind of foolish asceticism 
like Stimian Stylites, who is reputed to have spent 30 years on the top of a pillar to show how saintly and godly he was, what the conditions must have been like on the top of that pillar, beggar's imagination. But anyway, that's not what we are called to. We are called to seek the welfare of the places where we are. It's no accident, actually, that Daniel refers to this chapter because Daniel is the supreme example of this. Daniel was not a minister. Daniel was not a missionary. Daniel was not a youth worker. Daniel was not a preacher. Daniel was a high-placed civil servant who worked faithfully and honorably for many decades in the administration of Babylon and then on into Persia, which is where he is reading this, um, this chapter. You see, the fact that the world is passing away doesn't mean we don't play our part in it while we are here. It means two things, I think. It means we realize, first of all, this world is not everything. Build houses and gardens, which I suppose represent the material good things of life. We recognize that they're not everything. They will pass away, as everything else will pass away. But it also, I think, importantly underlines the fact that our ultimate destination is the new creation. C.S. Lewis said, God likes matter, he made it. The new creation is going to be a, a deeper country, greener grass, bluer sky. It's not going to be a disembodied existence in a shadow land, strumming at harps, wearing ethereal negligees. If that's what it is, count me out. It's going to be a wonderful, glorious new creation vivid, real, where all that is good in this creation will survive. I think that's what Revelation 21 means when it talks about the kings of the earth bringing their treasure into the city. I don't know if that means we are all Shakespeare theatre or not, but I'm allowed to hope. So, first of all, um, make a positive contribution to our communities. Secondly, pursue family life. Verse 6, take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. They may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Now, that, of course, is the echo of the early chapters, the very first chapter of the Bible, where the human beings are told to do just this. It doesn't mean, of course, that um, everybody can do this. We live in a fallen world. But it does mean, if we can, to have children carry on God-honoring patterns of behavior. So I think this is more important than it seems. It may seem very obvious, but surely what it is doing is underlying the God-given pattern of husband and wife and family life. And surely there is never a day when that was more needed. When we abandon that, there is no seeing the depths to which society will sink I was just reading this week about this thing that's called polyamory, where four or five people live together and have sex with anyone they want. You know, it's just totally indiscriminate. You see, when we abandon the one man, the one woman, in the image of God, in the covenant of marriage, that's the kind of thing it does. Now, we're not saying, I'm not saying this because we are naturally any better. We're not. When you think of it, every sin, including sexual sins, finds its echo in all our hearts. What I'm saying is without the grace of God, without the the Word of God to guide us, we are going simply to go on a gathering rush into an abyss where everything that holds society together simply simply dissolves. I suppose one of the most um, terrifying things about this, I've mentioned other things, is that it hardly rates a mention. At one time, this would have been regarded as the terrific scandal. Now, it just may be a bit weird, but, you know, people take it in their stride. Make a contribution. Pursue family life. But I think, I think the third thing, and it's, this is in verse 10, verse 7, seek the welfare of the city. Continue to pray for and work for people's salvation. Now, where do I get that? The word translated welfare is shalom, a great biblical word that means peace, 
harmony, which includes all kinds of benefits, security, welfare, all these good things that have been mentioned here, but ultimately peace with God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, what's happening here is, I think, do all these things, but never forget, never, never forget to pray for and work for the salvation of people. If I'm right in my interpretation of Daniel 4, the most spectacular example of this happened during the exile when King Nebuchadnezzar himself bowed before the King of Heaven, repented, and made his peace with him. I mean, that is the most spectacular thing in the book of Daniel, far more wonderful than the blazing furnace and the lions and the beasts out of the sea, that the great king of Babylon acknowledged the Lord and acknowledged him in humble repentance. So, first of all then, how do we live in this world? Now, the rest of the verses 8 to 14 tell us how to prepare for the world to come. Now, in a sense, we've already answered that, haven't we? We prepare for it by living as fully the life that God has given us. But you see, the point is, the more firmly we believe that one day Christ will return and wind up the affairs of this world and usher in a better one, the more urgent it is to engage in all lawful and worthy activities until He comes. So often this has been taken the wrong way. Since He's coming, the world is doomed. We don't do anything. That's not the point. The point is that the more firmly we believe in His return, the harder we will strive to, to work for Him until He comes. But more specifically now, Jeremiah is looking beyond, beyond the exile to the time of return. In verse 8, he says, you prepare for the world to come, which in this case was the return from exile back to Jerusalem, the temple, the sacrifices, and all the, all the things that Moses had given to them. And for us, it's preparing for the coming of the Lord. Listen to the true word and not the false prophets. That's one way we prepare for the world to come. We listen to the voice that comes from that world, the voice which, as our Lord Himself says, heaven and earth will pass away but my word will never pass away. This continual theme in Jeremiah, as we've seen in the last few chapters, I did not send them. That is the point. These false prophets, the Lord dismisses them, I did not send them. But as we looked at some weeks, how do we know the difference? Now, very, now there's a very close correlation between the effectiveness of the preaching and the carefulness of the listening. One of, the, one of the problems that we sometimes happens in churches is that people come and sit passively, like sheep, and think, well, you know, the religious experts doing their job, we've got to listen and make sure we do it. That is absolutely untrue to the biblical revelation. When the gospel is preached, whether it's preached like, you know, lecture like this, or it's a one-to-one, -one, or a Bible study, or a home group, or an evangelistic group. What is happening is that the speaker and the listeners together are listening to the Word of God and challenged by it. A good example of this in Acts chapter 17, um, where Paul visits a place called Berea. And Luke says of the people in Berea, they receive the Word with all eagerness examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Let me repeat that. As you listen to Paul, they received the Word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Now, there's two things here. First of all is the eagerness to listen to the Word being expounded, which is a sign of spiritual hunger, isn't it? A hunger to be fed on Christ but also realizing that we have to read the Bible for ourselves if we're going to get the most of it. It's surely no accident that it is churches where there is a strong pulpit ministry, where all kinds of Bible study groups grow up, where people become interested in reading the Bible for themselves and studying the Bible, talking about it, living it. And that's, that's a tremendous responsibility for both preacher and hearer, isn't it? 
you know, a preacher knows he's got it desperately wrong if somebody goes away and says, well, he's such a clever guy, I could never see that, I, I could never do that. What ought to be happening is people say, I can do that myself. Why didn't I see that before? In other words, it's, a, it's not simply passive listening. It's active listening, actively together exploring it. Well, that's the first thing. Listen to the Word of God, the Word which will not only help us to live in this world, but prepare us for the next. Secondly, realize that the time belongs to the Lord. Now, here the time is specified, verse 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Now, Jeremiah said that several times, and isn't it fascinating that 70 years later, Daniel reads these words and realizes the time has come. I mean, I find that one of the most moving things of, of all. Daniel himself, by then, an old, a very old man, towards the, end of his, uh, towards the end of his life, reading these words of Jeremiah, spoken to apparent, well, not just apparent, spoken to absolute ridicule and disbelief 70 years before, and, and now they're coming, uh, coming true. 70 years is a long time, but look what it produced, the prophet Daniel and the prophet Ezekiel. If we hadn't had the exile, we wouldn't have had these, these tremendous books with all they, ha they have to teach us. Now, we don't know the time. We don't know how long it will be before the Lord returns. Maybe He will return in the lifetime of some people in this room. Maybe it will be hundreds, even thousands of years. And at the beginning of Acts, the Jesus follower says, Lord, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And it's interesting what Jesus says to them. He doesn't say you're talking nonsense. What he says in effect is you haven't understood just how big a thing the kingdom is. The kingdom is going to be restored to Israel, but not ethnic Israel in a tiny, in a tiny country by the Mediterranean. He says it is not for you to know the times and the seasons, but you will be my witnesses where Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, and then the kingdom will come. The kingdom will come, and we are called to the service of that kingdom. We don't know when. That's why, you remember, in, the, in some of the parables and in the so-called Apocalypse Olivet Discourse of just before Jesus dies, he's, he says, keep watching because you don't know when, when he is going to come. And, he, and, 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 and the time is going to be long. That's the point, surely, of the parable of the talents. The, the master went away for a long time into a distant country. So, listening to the Word of God, realizing the time does not depend on us, but on the Lord. In verse 12, seeking the Lord. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all my heart. And that's intimately related to hearing His voice. With all your heart, it means loving Him and following Him. Not just following Him out of a sense of duty, but loving Him. Loving Him and He says, I will be found when you seek me with all your heart. That does not mean for one moment. The Lord says, if you don't seek me, I'm jolly well not going to seek you. What it means is the Lord is saying, unless you seek me, you won't realize how much I want you, how anxious I am to, that you hear my voice. And the fourth thing is trusting Him to do what He promised. That's verse 14. I will restore your fortunes. I will bring you back. It's very important to notice that it's I who's going to do this, not I'm going to raise up some great leader who is going to defeat the Babylonian Empire and bring, bring you back, and then Jerusalem will be, will be a superpower. No, I will bring you back. I think as we live in this world, as we prepare for the next, we need to remember this. It, the work is not our work. It's God's work. You know, you'd never guess that when you look at most church websites. Always how friendly churches are. Always, all, you know, always how wonderful we are and how many activities. 
I'm longing someday to see a church website which has on it the words of John Wesley, I offered Christ to them. Remember, that's all we have to offer to the world. A footnote on the rest of the chapter. There will always be powerful voices urging the other way. And that seems to me to be the point of, of this. These, these guys, um, the, to, to have in, you see there's false prophets in Babylon as well. This guy, verse 21, Ahab and Zedekiah, they are prophesying falsely. It's interesting actually, verse 22, the Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. Cannot read that without remembering Daniel 3 and the servants of the Lord whom God prevented from being destroyed in the fire. There are powerful voices speaking the other way, and these voices are going to prove to be false, but they are very, very seductive. We tend congenitally to be short-term, don't we? We like, I mean, we like things yesterday. We want to, we want to jam immediately and all the time. What Jeremiah is saying is the end is certain, but the way to it will be tough. Just as, mentioning Proverbs again, wisdom calls out in the streets, so does folly. And the thing is, they sound exactly alike. They use the same vocabulary, they invite you to their parties, and it needs wisdom to discern them. But you see, what Jeremiah is saying, there's only one safe way, and that is to do, learn how to live in this world, learn how to prepare for the world to come. There will always be times, there'll be tough times. There'll be rejoicing as well, as we'll sing in a moment or two. There'll always be times of sunshine. There will always be times of darkness. There will always be battles won, but there will always be struggling in the fight. And that's going to go on until the end. But the end is certain. And what is the end? God will be God, and the world will know it. Amen. Let's pray. God, our Father, we are so ready to listen to the, the voices of folly, which find such a ready echo in our own hearts and in our own hormones. And so we pray, Lord, that you will help us to hear the voice, the voice of the Son of God, the voice that wakes the dead, the voice that protects, the voice that judges and the voice that saves, and help us as we continue our pilgrimage to look to the, the home at the end when we are struggling in the night. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Our final hymn will be on the screen, Come People of the Risen King. <clears throat>
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power at work among us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and in eternity. May his love surround us, his power strengthen us, and bring us in the light of grace to the light of glory. Amen.